name is John Gacy. I am a shop steward in Charleston, South Carolina, a member of the almighty Local 509, and I'm a proud member of the Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Today's webinar is sponsored by UPS Teamsters United, which is a project of TDU. We have a great program lined up for you today, so let's go ahead and get started with our first speaker. He's a shop steward in Boston, Local 25, a member of the TDU Steering Committee, and an absolute personal favorite of mine. It's a privilege and honor for me to introduce our brother, Greg Kerwood. Take it away, Greg. Thank you, brother. Thank you for the kind words. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon and good morning. It's great to see so many people here. Um, as uh, John said, my name is Greg Kerwood. I'm a shop steward on Local 25 in Boston and a member of the International Steering Committee of TDU. Uh, I'm here just to give a little perspective before we get started uh, on contract enforcement as to what is actually going on. Um, everyone is seeing lots of headlines uh, about layoffs, automation, uh, management, job cuts. And the question is, uh, you know, what's the reality? Uh, what, what's We're hearing the spin from the company. What's the reality? So there's two things going on here. Um, the first thing, there's two issues. The company is addressing both at once. Uh, the first thing is the company did not meet their earnings expectations. Now that upsets Wall Street gets investors a little panicky, and we all know that this company caters to investors in Wall Street before everything else. Um, there was an explosion of volume during the pandemic, and obviously there was an inevitable pullback that was going to happen. Um, whenever expectations are not met, Wall Street loves to hear phrases like streamlining, trimming the fat, reducing labor costs, uh, but we have to keep in mind that UPS is not hurting. Um, their dividend has not gone down since they went public uh, well over 20 years ago. Uh, the profits are increasing over the long term. Carol Tomei, our wonderful CEO, just received a huge raise. Um, and volume is expected to continue to increase for years going forward. So what's the second part here? What's really going on underneath all this? Well, what happened uh, last summer was that the company witnessed the power of members organizing, standing together during our contract campaign, and it made them nervous because they witnessed what we could accomplish when we stand together and work collectively. So now they're going to push back, and they're pushing back by trying to scare our members while they're pleasing Wall Street, uh, by having layoffs, excessive layoffs, layoffs that are more than what they arguably need, um, because workers who fear their jobs don't stand up or stand together. They don't enforce contracts and they don't file grievances. So the company is trying to intimidate us, divide us, and conquer us, as always, as a pushback to our fight from last summer. But we are Teamsters. When the company tries to divide us, push us down, make us scared, we don't just take it. We unite, we stand strong, and we fight back even harder. And that's what we're here to do today. We're here to teach you the new language and how to use it to unite with your brothers and sisters and use contract enforcement to fight back and put this company back on the defensive. We showed them last summer that we run the show. And now we're gonna give them a not so friendly reminder by standing together and holding them to this contract. And that is what TDU is all about. We're a national network of rank and file Teamsters sharing information and enforcement strategies, making our union stronger from the bottom up. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to join TDU become part of this rank and file team. If you join today, you'll receive a free t-shirt or hoodie with your membership. In addition, you'll be tapping into a wealth of knowledge and experience that will help you become the most powerful member you can be and build a team with your brothers and sisters that cannot be stopped. Because member education is member power. Thanks, back to you, John. <clears throat> today, we're gonna to talk about contract enforcement and organizing tactics for fighting layoffs, including Beat, divide, and conquer, enforce daily guarantee, protect jobs, enforcing nine, five, and soups working, and enforcing share posts. So let me turn it over to TD, TDU organizer, Willem Morris. Thanks everyone. It's great to see so many people on the call this morning. My name is Willem Morris. I'm one of the national organizers for TDU, Teamsters for Democratic Union. Um, and I wanted to little, give a little bit of perspective about uh, what the purpose of this call is today. Um, so 
As a national organizer, I travel across the country, uh, giving workshops and educational trainings to members. TDU has had these in-person workshops. We've also had the online webinars and the IBT has given great uh, training for contract enforcement. So I wanted to talk about a little bit, why doesn't everyone enforce the contract? One of the reasons um, is a lack of knowledge. And everyone here today is here to learn. And we have some new tips and techniques to encourage people uh, to give all the right techniques and tools to enforce the contract. But a much bigger reason why members aren't enforcing the contract is fear or anxiety that they're going to be the only one stepping up and getting a target on your, their back. In TDU, in almost all these webinars, you hear us talking about enforcement, but you also hear us talking about parking lot meetings and social events and different ways to get your coworkers involved. That's one of the things we really want to encourage this year. When we talk about these locals that are doing a great job with enforcement, it's not just one steward who's a superhero for their building. They have all of their members in the building getting informed and getting encouraged that they want to build a team to enforce the contract together. So when you listen to this webinar today, you want to do two things. One, you want to listen to the things that you're unfamiliar with and that you don't know. And two, you want to listen to these techniques and how we're teaching you, and you can go out and teach your members to do the same thing. Thanks everyone for being here today, and I'm going to pass it to Beth Breslau, another organizer for TDU. Thank you. Thanks so much, Willem. And um, I just wanted to add, I think uh, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question, we're going to have some time to take questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, enforcing daily guarantees as a way to fight against layoffs. Um, when members aren't uh, staying to do the work or when management thinks that they can get away with sending people home without their guarantee, um, supervisors are doing bargaining unit work, it's not a good situation. And in Local 251 and Local 804 in New York, there have been some big victories around enforcing daily guarantees. Um, Part-timers have a three and a half hour daily guarantee, but we all know it doesn't stop the company from sending people home early routinely and taking money out of members' pockets. Um, even members who agree to go home when they're asked uh, have a right to a three-hour guarantee. There's an MOU at the back of the National Master Agreement on page 201 that states that this guarantee of three hours can't be waived. Um, it's not forfeited if management sends somebody home. Um, local 804 and, and Local 251, New York and Rhode Island have enforced this language and won. Uh, back pay in Rhode Island and uh, a pending state claim on wage theft, uh, wage and hour violations, and in New York, a binding arbitration agreement. Um, after this webinar, you're going to be sent a toolkit with some tips on how you can enforce this MOU and enforce your daily guarantee language. Um, but the most important part is making sure that people know that this is, this is a contractual right and that we need to stick together to enforce it. So um, I'd like to ask uh, Dwight Virgos, uh, an inside steward in the Nassau building in Local 804, um, to speak on, uh, you know, it didn't start with the arbitration win. Um, it started with an information campaign. So Dwight, can you tell us a little bit about how you all were able to enforce the daily guarantee language in your building? Yes, thanks, Beth. Uh, what was happening is we were noticing that a lot of uh, part-timers were being sent home early and not being paid their guarantees, and also that they were even being called before the start of their shifts. Listen, we're, it's, the volume is a little light today, as you know, and so we're asking you if you want to stay home, and they weren't being paid for the day and obviously not being given that guarantee. So that was really the, the, the genesis of it. And what did you do to make sure that people knew that that's not how this is supposed to go down? Well, what we did was we did one-on-one -on -one with the members, and obviously in this case, part-timers. We would also hold um, small meetings uh, with them on whether in the different areas in the in the building, so that way, and outside as well, so that way they would know that listen, you're guaranteed three and a half hours. If the work is finished at a minimum, it's three hours, and so it's and it's enforceable. And don't be afraid to speak up and so forth. So that that got the word out. And as you know, in the buildings, once one person knows that you're being shorted, then they tell the next person, and then the word spreads, you know, mouth to mouth. So that was that was uh, very instrumental on our part. 
So really getting started meant, you know, talking about this issue, making sure that people knew their rights, making sure mm -hmm. that people were informing others about their rights. And how did you catch the people that slipped through the cracks? Well, what we did was we, we have the recaps and the time cards. So we're going over the recaps daily to see, um, obviously, who worked, who didn't, the the different codes that they have, whether it's a um, um, OPH or a sick day and outside of that, um, making sure that they were getting paid and being paid correctly um, for their guarantee. So the, the recaps were very um, good in helping us to determine all of that. And Article 4 gives stewards the right to this information. Um, so once you got the information and you were able to see that there were still people who weren't being paid for their three hours, even when they reported to work, what was your next step? So the next step was go to management. And in, in our case, we have full-time supervisors who are in charge of different areas. So we went to full-time supervisors. Listen, this employee worked yesterday. They were not given their three and a half. You've got to pay them. If they refuse, then we'd go to the preload manager and try to work it out with him. If he refused, then we would um, file all affected um, employees' grievance based on the MOU as well as our um, local supplement as well. So when you filed the all affected MO the all affected grievance on the MOU, you had your documentation in order. You had already done everything in your power to make sure that the message had gotten out to members. You had involved yes. other members in that process yes. and made sure that the word was spread and mm. shared that information. Yes. And then once you realized that this was happening in your building, what was sort of next in the local? Well, uh, as uh, for us here in 804, once we once something is going on in one building or even in one area, we ask the other stewards what's going on in your ear. And for us, we went um, local wide and find out that it was more of a practice than we had uh, thought. As a matter of fact, we had even won close to $94,000 in one of the buildings where they weren't doing that. And, you know, paperwork was gathered and we won that, that, um, that award. So once we realized that was the case, then we decided then, Obviously, we got to take it to arbitration because they're not going to want to pay all these people all the back pay. And that's how on February 6th of this year, we got a, a cease and desist concerning this from um, the arbitrator. That's an awesome win. And it's a good model for other places to follow. So you started with spreading the word, making yes. sure people knew their rights. Mm -hmm. You followed up and made sure that you were documenting all of the violations using yes, the documentation yep. from the company. Mm -hmm. You gathered witness statements to prove your case, and you worked with your business agent and other stewards in your local to bring a, a winning case to arbitration. Yeah. So um, this toolkit is going to be sent out to everybody who's on the webinar um, after we're done. And I want to thank you so much, Dwight, for sharing that yeah. story. Sure. Um this is a tool that can be used in other places. Absolutely. And um, we're going to, like I said before, we're going to take questions at the end. So if you have questions, put them in your Q in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much, Dwight. Sure, um, Beth. And, and if I just might just say real quick, Beth, I know one of the things that happens sometimes when things like these happen, and I think the gentleman before um, uh, mentioned it, but the thing is the members can't be afraid to stand up for their rights. The contract is there to back you up 100%. And as stewards and business agents and locals, we will back you. So don't be afraid to stand up for your contractual rights. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dwight. And uh, that's actually a great segue to our next topic. A lot of, uh, a lot of members experience fear of retaliation and uh, it makes it a challenge, like Willem was saying, um, to stand up against layoffs by taking on excessive overtime and harassment. People are afraid of being singled out. Um, and we're going to hear about a few strategies that people have uh, in different areas for using eight-hour requests in 9-5 language um, to fight back against layoffs and redistribute volume and uh, the methods that people are using to get that information out and build more solidarity by leafleting and tabling and holding parking lot meetings. Um, so we're gonna first talk a little bit about the eight hour request language. Um, this is a great tool uh, for protecting your day it's, and protecting your time. It's also can be used as a tool for fighting back against layoffs. Um, 
national contract language says that package card drivers have to provide three days of notice for an eight hour request and that the company is responsible for adjusting your dispatch before your start time. If you're going to be over and you know it, you notify the company by one o'clock and they're supposed to send somebody to take some volume off you. And the penalty pay has increased. So now if you're if you're violated on the day that you use your request, um, you're paid two hours at double time. Uh, some supplements have additional language on eight hour requests. So you should check your supplement. Um, the way that people typically use this language or the way that a lot of people think about this language is about really protecting your time individually. Um, you got to get to a kid's softball game, you have plans after work, um, and you want to make sure that you're not staying, staying out way later than you expected. Um, but members in Local 443 uh, in Connecticut are using this language as a tool to fight layoffs. So we're going to hear from Josh Albright. Uh, he's a package car driver in Local 443 about um, some of this, some of the ways that they've used this language uh, to organize in their loop and um, push back against layoffs. So, Josh? Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Josh Albright. I'm a member of Local 443 out of New Haven, and I want to thank you very much for letting me speak today. Thank you. So, um, you guys do... Um, you guys do a good job of coordinating your eight hour requests across yep. your loop. So how do you start building better solidarity in your loop? Uh, well, it starts with the eight hour day request. Uh, what we do is, well, what UPS does actually is when you request an eight hour day, typically what they do is they will take the work off of you and they will pass it on to the driver, usually next in line in your loop or driver adjacent to you. So what we do, is we which after we started noticing that is that it just takes one person and uh, we try to get as many people in an area in a loop in a town to request an eight hour day all at the same time and how do you start do you start with just you do it and you you make the request yourself and then you hope that other people do it too correct well so, sort of um it doesn't take everybody to be on board with what with this idea but it just takes one person and so it starts with just say you and then you contact the person that's next to you somebody who typically shares a work area with you and you just tell them hey i'm going to take an eight hour day on such and such a day and uh ups will probably just take the work off of me they're going to dump it on you you know i really don't like that they do this to you you should probably ask for an eight hour day too that day and most people are willing to do that and then you move on to the next guy and the next guy. And the more people that you have uh, doing this, uh, it kind of snowball snowballs and picks up and more people are willing to do it. That's right. And people also are less fearful about, you know, sticking their neck out when they know that they're not alone. That's correct. Yes. And what's the what's the result when you get the majority of people in your loop to use an eight hour request on the same day? Well, it's kind of a win-win situation. Our goal ultimately is to get UPS to put more routes in. And if UPS decide that for some reason not to, it's, you know, like you said, it's uh, uh, two hours at double time uh, for every driver that's willing to grieve that. That's right. So best case scenario, they put a route back in. And worst case scenario, it's extra money in people's pockets. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, and organizing within your loop is also can be an effective strategy for uh, nine fives. Also, if everybody's yeah. on the list and everybody is filing, you know, the company has to put that volume somewhere. It really only takes one or two people who are willing to stand up and just show other members that there's really nothing to be afraid of. You file those grievances, join the nine five list, uh, ask for eight hour days. You're guaranteed to a month. And when you do get paid for these nine five grievances, and you will if you stand up uh, for your rights, walk around, show everybody, hey, I got paid. You know, help them. Uh, uh, you know, stand with them and help them sign the nine five list. Contact your steward because the steward's supposed to run it in your building. So it, it just takes one or two people. That's all it takes. Show people that is there's nothing to be afraid of. Thank you so much, Josh. So that's a great example of starting small. You know, you have one or two people that are willing to do something together, talk to the other people in your loop about it, show people that they're not alone, and it's a pretty much guaranteed outcome. 
So we're gonna um, talk a little bit now about the OJS language um, and how members are using the new OJS language to bring people together and make sure that members feel comfortable enforcing their, their contractual rights and see that they're not alone. Um, the OJS language in the new contract uh, provides that the company has to inform and provide notice of 24 hours before a ride along and the reason for the ride. So they, they can't blindside people, they can't give a real wide window and no explanation. Um, it has to be specific enough. And that documentation of the ride has to be provided to the driver and the steward after. Um, so everybody knows that the company uses OJS rides uh, to try and scare people, speed people up. Um, we've had webinars about uh, hunting season and management by stress. We've had webinars about uh, just preparing for OJS rides and preparing members in your center for OJS rides because it's a good, it's a, it's a tact, it's an effective tactic the company uses to divide and conquer. Um, we're going to hear from John Gacy uh, on how members in his building took this opportunity, the OJS opportunity, um, to bring people together and build more solidarity. Um, so John, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what was going on in your building before your pre-shift meeting. Yeah, thank you, Beth. Uh, so we immediately saw an increase in harassment, intimidation, and a ton of OJS rides without, as you stated, any notice. Um, and it was clear we needed to do something. So uh, we, in order to build solidarity amongst our siblings, we decided to have a parking lot meeting on the inside of the building to educate members. And what we did is we sent out a mass text 72 to, and 48 hours prior to the meetings. Uh, the day before, after the PCM, one of our stewards would yell out, uh, you know, uh, union meeting tomorrow. And then we would do another text message that following morning, the morning of the PCM, because we know people have a million things on their mind. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that uh, we reminded folks. Um, and so what we would do is um, at the meeting, we would talk about the uh, OJS toolkit and uh, rights that the members had. We also would explain to them that, um, you know, the contract is really nothing more than a stack of papers unless you enforce it and how important that is. We also ask for commitments uh, by a show of hands um, on enforcing the contract and also uh, just to hold each other accountable and uh, protect each other. So since that time, We've seen a difference. We've seen a shift in the members. You know, folks are talking more about their rides and the toolkits and how much it's benefited them. Um, and also um, we're seeing folks uh, talk to each other and come to us as stewards and with questions and, on what they should do. And uh, also how they've seen the shift in like work. Like if you're, if the supervisor on a uh, truck with you that one day, then the next day the work is much more. That day it's a lot less. So um, just, uh, keeping a record, uh, we're seeing folks do that more. And also we're seeing um, management's going to be management, but we have seen a shift in how they're handling the rides. Um, and we hope we hope to see more because they understand that as members, we are ready to enforce the contract. Thank you so much, Sean. So just the small act of bringing people together and literally showing people that this is a universal experience uh, they were able to see um, progress in the way that management was treating people. And also drivers were, you know, using these tools and applying these tools to their day to day, monitoring what's wrong with their what's wrong with their loads, making sure that they're working at a safer and sustainable pace um, and understanding and recognizing that these are problems we're all having and we need to be talking about them with each other so that nobody's feeling totally alone. Um, so thanks again, John. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Willem, uh, and he's going to take us on to our next portion of the agenda. Thanks, Beth. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about supervisors working, and I'm going to talk with Tina Young, a steward out of Local 20 in the Mommy Building near Toledo, Ohio. Um, when members are laid off, there are no supervisors that should be working. All of us know that, um, but we have to take the necessary steps to start enforcing this language. Uh, Tina is a new steward uh, who became a steward in the past year, 
Uh, she came to TDU convention and then has been putting these practices into play in her building. Uh, so my first question for Tina, um, why do you think it's important to have a team of people uh, in your building ready to support and file on the supervisor's working grievances? Hi. Um, if a supervisor realizes that you're filing on them, they will sometimes try and not work around you. But if we're all spread out around through the hub, they, you know, we can catch them and <laughs> we'll all be around. So um, then uh, another reason is that sometimes they will have multiple supervisors working around you all at the same time. And you can't, you can file on all of them, but you will only get paid for one of them. So um, that's why we want to divide and conquer. So it's uh, one supervisor, um, one employee per supervisor will get paid. So example, if um, you can get paid for um, two supervisors in the same day, if supervisor A is working around you before uh, the break and supervisor B is working around after the break, you can file on two on the same day, just not at the same time, so. Great, and so for you, Tina, um, we know the importance of having this team, but how have you been able to talk to your other members and engage them and train them to uh, file supervisors working grievances with you? I mainly just introduce myself to people. I go up and talk to them and get to know them, exchange phone numbers, um, tell them they can call me and talk anytime. Uh, and it's good to have their numbers too, so that um, I can reach out to them as well. Um, you know, you wanna be approachable and um, just willing to listen to people and let them talk. Um, once I arranged a meeting with our business agent and about 12 people showed up and we were able to all ask questions and we had a great, that was a great time. We all learned a lot. And then there's always just meeting in the parking lot. And, uh, That's great. Yeah, and I know yeah. for everyone, Tina used to be a teacher. And so she's great at teaching these lessons to her members. I have personally heard from many of the other part-timers on Tina's shift about how she's helping them get involved. It's a really great example for what everyone else can do on this call. Tina, what are some of the common mistakes you see if people are filing their first grievances? Um, what things do people forget to add or make mistakes in the grievance forms? Um, one thing is you, they need to realize that you have to file within five uh, business days uh, from the time of the infraction. And then um, sometimes just saying too much on the grievance, they can turn it around and use it against you. So it's just helpful if you just stick to the facts and uh, kind of like who, what, when, where. So on this day, this supervisor was doing this work in this area from this time to this time. That's good. And then on the grievance form, there's a place said state relief thought. And it's a good idea to put in that section also to be made whole in all ways. That way everything is covered. And the biggest mistake I see that people are just afraid to file. You know, I say, turn the tables, start filing and let them be afraid of you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tina. This is a great job. Thanks for participating. And I'm going to pass it off to uh, David Levine from TDU. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, SurePost. Uh, that was great. Everybody's been great. I want to thank all the uh, TDU members who've been uh, speaking on the on the webinar, UPS Teamsters United is a project and campaign of Teamsters for a Democratic Union, and I I work as a TDU staff director, which means I I work for uh, all of you. Thank you. Um, so on SurePost, we want stronger uh, language in the contract to reduce the amount of SurePost packages that go to uh, the post office and 
strengthen um, our rights and increase the volume of sure post packages that should be that are redirected back to Teamsters um, to package car drivers for delivery. So the place to look uh, for this language is Article 26, uh, Section 4, and let's get into a couple of details on it, starting with the next slide. So um, I can't see this slide. I hope others can. Um, so under this language, the maximum size allowed has been re uh, reduced from three cubic feet to cu two cubic feet. That's uh, 3,456 uh, cubic inches, which is like, you know, unless you're some kind of uh, human calculator, that might not be ab obvious to you. It's not to me what that is. But so just by way of uh, a guide, like, you can picture like a typical countertop microwave um, that uh, exceeds, uh, that would be oversized for something going to shirt post. The same goes for uh, a golf bag uh, that would be oversized um, and exceed the limit. The maximum weight limit is 10 pounds and it's not the 10 pounds that the customer claims it weighs, but actual weight of 10 pounds as on the scale. Okay, if we can go to the next slide, we can take a look at some of the additional um, protections and rights that we have. So um, close proximity, you know, the company is supposed to redirect sure post packages for delivery by package car drivers. If the delivery address is within a close proximity of an address where a package car, where a package driver delivers. Uh, and close proximity is defined as like 100 feet. Um, we all know like sure post packages are only supposed to be delivered to residential addresses, no businesses. In terms of right to redirect packages, UPS is required to make employees aware of their right, these restrictions and their right to redirect packages so that they're delivered by Teamsters and management can't, um, it explicitly says in the language, uh, management can't discipline members for redirecting a package under this under this language. So this is good, strong language, but we also know that UPS is violating it every day and sending packages to the post office while Teamster drivers are laid off. And so Teamster uh, stewards, members, locals are starting to fight back. I want to call on Jerry Baker from Indiana Local 135, who's been one of those members taking actions on this. Hello, uh, my name's Jerry. You got, you got me on there? We do. Uh, okay, thanks right. for being here, brother. So tell us, tell us a word about how members have been affected, uh, where you work, and what y'all have been doing about it. Well, basically, uh, at our facility, it's a small facility. We have uh, 21 drivers, and we'll run, on average, 15, 16 areas, sometimes 17. And I remember when uh, SurePost was introduced, uh, what, a couple uh, contracts ago, the volume that was going to the post office was, you know, a couple hundred, maybe 300 tops. And it's just continued to grow. Uh, just this week, I've seen 600 uh, pieces go to the post office. Saturday, they had 750 pieces go to the post office. And, you know, and I've been tackling this now for going on two years. And the problem is, is we've never even been able to come to the table to even redirect packages. Uh, we're locked out. Our system doesn't allow us to. My center manager has never been motivated to make this a change. So um, I just, I met with, I had a local panel about three weeks ago and labor was there and labor acknowledged that this was a problem and it needed to be, needs to be fixed. And here we are three weeks later, nothing has been done. So I, so I filed a grievance and basically in the grievance, I'm asking that the company abide, abide by the contract under article 26 of section four and train our employees on how to identify packages that are overweight that are uh, they're oversized and also give the, the capacity for our clerks to also redirect it, you know, provide them with the technology, which right now currently we do not have. 
and also teach them them on how to redirect the packages. So that's basically where we are at. So you're saying in your area, it's not just that the clerks haven't been trained on how to do it, but they literally don't have access to the software that would allow them to redirect the packages. Uh, no, we do not have the, the access to it. And we're not the only facility that has experienced this. When I, where I really started getting enlightened is about, I became a steward about three years ago and I started covering feeders and I started going to other facilities and seeing how they run their operations. And another facility is close to us they used to build a redirect and that was the Muncie facility. And then they were locked out to where they couldn't redirect either. So somewhere someone's made a decision or made some change to where we could not redirect these packages, but Anderson, we have never been able to. So I've been fighting this and I just finally put pen to paper. I've been working with my business agent, Carrie Durth has been very supportive and um, hopefully we can, we can have some success because this is just uh you know, it's, you know, I want to see more guy. We got one guy's been on layoffs since February. We've had any, as, uh, as many as three on layoff. And then here we are pumping 750 packages to the post office. And it's just, it's ridiculous. Okay. And thank one, you for that. Thank day. you. for Thank you for that. And thank you for everything you're doing uh, to enforce uh, the contract. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, you know, uh, Brother Baker just told us the first step um uh, to take here on enforcing the sure post contract language if employees haven't been trained on redirecting packages or clerks are unable to redirect them um file a grievance and we'll have a sample uh we'll make several sample grievances available to all of you right after this webinar and this will be one of them okay let's take a look at step two the next step is to find sure post packages on a belt or a truck that violate the contractual limits that we were talking about um, and file a grievance. Um, and ideally, you know, you want to find um, packages that violate each type. Um, so a weight violation, a proximity violation, um, a size violation, but whatever it is that you find. Um, Spread the word, get people looking for them uh, on the preload and get drivers looking for them and file um, grievances uh, on those, you know, on those violations. Okay, step three, and this is a biggie and a really important one. You're going to want to file an information request um, to back up your grievances and to document additional ongoing violations. And this is super, super key because we can't possibly, like, of all the millions of packages that get shipped, we can't possibly find every sure post package that violates the regulations and scramble around and be looking all day for those. But what we can do is use information requests to make the company expose its own violations. So, again, we're going to have a sample for you, but these are some of the things you're going to be asking for in an information request. One, the total number of sure post packages delivered to the post offices that service the same zip codes where you found packages that should have been redirected to a package car. So you find a violation, and then you're gonna um, you're gonna be requesting all a list. Um, you're gonna be requesting the volume for all sure post packages that were delivered within those zip codes the same zip codes. Two, you want the final mile address of each of, of of those sure post packages in those zip codes. Um, three, you want the package delivery records for the sender that delivers to the same zip codes for the same five year, for the same five day period. Um, and you also want packages uh, that were actually redirected um, by UPS that were sure post packages during the same five day period. And importantly, down here, you see that cute little hand. You want to ask for this information in electronic format, and that is also key, and here's why. Um, you're going to take that information, and um, I hope people can see this slide. Um, you should be seeing like a, all of these red dots. Um, what you can do is you can take uh, the delivery records that are provided from UPS. 
and they'll give them to you in like an Excel file. And you can upload that file after you format it to Google Maps. And you'll get a map that looks like this. This is an actual map of three zip codes and all of the SurePost packages that were delivered in a five-day period um, in those zip codes. Now you can also, since you asked for the UPS um, delivery records, um, you can superimpose that on top. So let's look at the next slide. Everything that's blue here is a, UP, is a package that was delivered in the same five-day period by a UPS driver. Everything that's red was something that was sent to the post office. Now, way off here on the left, near where it says Concord Bend or Riverside Drive, maybe those were packages that were not in proximity to a UPS delivery. Okay, but you can see there's enormous overlap. And these packages that were sent to the post office, um, many, many, many could have been delivered by uh, and should have been delivered by Teamster package drivers if they weren't violating uh, the company wasn't violating the contract. And this is the kind of co documentation you want to have um, to back up your grievance when you're taking it uh, to the grievance panel if you want to win it. Now, I know this is getting kind of wonky and we're not going to have a class here now about using Excel and Google Maps and things like this. Um, but if you want to pursue a case like this, we can help you do that and document it. So we've told you the first steps and we can go to the next slide here. We'll be sending out after this uh, webinar a toolkit that um, outlines the language, outlines some initial steps to take, has some sample grievances that you can file to start, um, and then a sample information request so that you can document the violations further. And once you get to that point um, and you've file that information request. Uh, we can help you with the part about, um, it's very, it's very, very, very straightforward. We can do a training with you about how to uh, create those maps and document your case. So if you're interested um, in pursuing this case, we wanna know and coordinate with you. You're gonna be getting a take action form sent out to you after the webinar um, and fill it out and just, um, check the box next to SharePost and leave a note for us down at the bottom and you'll be contacted by a TDU member or organizer to coordinate with you. And for other follow-up steps, I'm gonna kick it back, kick it over to Willem Morris. Thanks a lot. Thanks, David. Um, and thank you to all of the members and speakers who have participated on this call. Um, sometimes people ask, us, what is TDU? And TDU is an educational resource, but TDU is also Greg Kerwood, John Gacy, and Tina, and all of the speakers today. TDU is a network of activists who want to enforce the contract and help each other do that. So in my region that I cover in the Midwest and the Central region, there are networks of shop stewards with 50 or 60 people meeting every month, talking about enforcement. So if you want to get involved, fill out this take action form reach out to us and we can connect with other people who are excited about the same kind of stuff as you. Um, every building is different um, and we want to be able to talk with people one-on-one. -on -one. So this follow-up form allows us to answer your specific questions and give you the tools you need to enforce the contract. Finally, uh, I wanna pass it uh, to John Gacy to wrap up everything on this webinar. And then he's gonna push us to a Q and A and we're gonna answer these some of these 52 questions that have been put in the Q&A box. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thank you, Willem. As Willem said, we're about to open up the Q&A. If you have any questions, use the Q&A button <clears throat> on the button on your screen to type the questions. We'll take as many questions as we can. <clears throat> but before we do that, UPS Teams to United is a campaign of TDU. We're a grassroots network of rank and file Teamsters sharing resources and strategies to stand up to management and build a stronger union. I personally joined um, to be candid because I was in a really bad place. Um, I was uh, disqualified from driving. After about two weeks, the management called me in the office and said, hey, you know, we just don't think you're a good fit for this. And uh, we're gonna disqualify you. And hey, I heard it was your birthday, happy birthday. And that's a true story. So that was a brutal day for me. Um, and I swore to myself that I would never 
allow my union siblings or anyone to go through that. So fast forward, uh, my wife says to me one day, hey, have you heard of 2DU? And I was like, no, I haven't. So from that day, um, it's been a fantastic marriage. Uh, TDU has given me confidence, uh, empowerment to educate myself and my union, my union siblings, also to stand toe to toe with management. So I'm saying today, I sincerely encourage you to join. If you're not a member, please be a part of it. Join, get in touch, get involved. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to my brother Willem for our questions and answers Q and A. Great. And again, uh, please direct your questions down to the Q&A box. We have so many questions, we're not gonna get into all of them, uh, but we're gonna get to as many as we can. The first question um, is about the three hour guarantee. Uh, if a supervisor asks you to leave and you refuse to leave until you get your three hours, what do you do if they say they will fire you if you don't leave? Um you cannot refuse to leave the building if you're asked to leave the building. Um, what you need to do is grab yourself a witness, a fellow member or your steward, uh, so that you have a witness that lets them know, lets them uh, testify that the supervisor is telling you you have to go home, and then you file the grievance. But you do not want to refuse to leave the property if you're instructed to leave the property. You, you do as instructed and grieve later. The last thing you want is the company charging you with insubordination or calling the police or some other uh, crazy scheme to get you in deep trouble. Uh, okay. And Greg, what about, uh, this person said that on Mondays, uh, their part-time shift is only two hours or less. Uh, can they still enforce the three and a half hour guarantee? Yes. Under article 22, section five, you have a three and a half hour guarantee every day. So if you're not getting it, it doesn't matter. It's Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, you report as scheduled, you're entitled to three and a half hours. So file the grievance. If it's everybody, file all affected for everybody on the shift and make sure everybody gets paid. And William, this is Dwight. I'll just add to that as well. It can be the three and a half hours work or three and a half hours pay. So the company can make their choice. Great. Thank you guys both. Uh, then we have some other questions uh, for drivers about the OJS rides. If a driver doesn't receive a 24 hour notice for an OJS ride, can they prevent the ride from occurring? You always have to work as instructed, but you should definitely file a grievance after the fact. That's correct. You can't, you cannot refuse. If they want to get on the car, you file the grievance. Inform your steward, let them know, and file the grievance. And uh, John, I think you had a good example for this. Uh, one of the best uh, tools to combat this kind of thing is providing all your members with information. If the company sees that all the members know their rights or parking lot meeting, uh, they're less likely to try to violate it. Is that kind of what happened for you guys and your local, John? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, it's uh, definitely once they, like, as you stated, once they see that all the members are together, um, you'll start to see their tune change. But, um, you know, it's definitely about enforcing that contract and members standing strong and together. Great. Thank you, John. The next question um, uh is Josh Albrecht still on the call? How do you find out how many drivers at a time can take an eight hour day? I've been told before that too many were requested for a particular day to accommodate my requests. Uh, in our building, it's 10% of the works, a minimum 10% of the work staff. So if you say hypothetically have 95 drivers on the road that day, it's, um, it, it's not gonna be nine and a half drivers, it's gonna be a full 10. Great. And you can find that in the contract language, Josh? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Um, another one for you, Josh. Uh, what, what to do if the company refuses an eight-hour request? Is there a recourse or a penalty if the company refuses an eight-hour request? Yes, it's the same penalty. If you under Article 37, if you request a day and you, you work over eight and a half, or if you request a day and you were not approved when you should have been approved, uh, as was said, it's 10% of the drivers in your center. Um, they are on the hook for the same penalty. Great. Thank you, Greg. Another question for you, Greg. UPS has laid off drivers in my building but it's also asking for volunteers on Saturdays and Mondays. Uh, what can we do about this? That's a, a great question. And the only answer is to organize those members 
that are volunteering on, on Saturdays and Mondays uh, and inform them that they're playing into the company's hands, giving the company what it wants and costing their brothers and sisters that are on layoff. Um, if no one is willing to volunteer, the company will have no choice but to bring people back to cover those shifts and do that work. So as much as you may want to uh, align your pocket a little bit with extra work, uh, it is much better for everybody, uh, especially if you're working late the rest of the days because you're swamped with overtime because people are laid off. Uh, the way you address that is to not volunteer for the extra work and force the company to bring people back. Great. Um, thank you very much, Greg. I have some questions for David Levine, the staff director for TDU, about SurePost. Um, David, could I call you on to talk about how can I enforce SurePost if my BA has not yet provided instructions or guidance? Yeah, it looks like there's a whole bunch of questions on this. Maybe I'll just grab them and deal with them uh, rapid fire style. So in terms of how can you do it if your BA hasn't provided instructions or guidance, um, well, you you know, we're sending out a toolkit with instructions and guidance and you can start, you can start there uh, and working on those and then talk with your, with your BA about it. I think that the IBT contract enforcement campaign is also soon going to be issuing um, more info and guidance on this stuff but uh everything that we talked about here is uh are the steps that you can start taking to enforce the contract a person asked if um on preload we catch mislabeled packages that say five pounds but weigh 55 pounds um wow that's really stretching uh the limit management refuses to audit the package and just sends them on this is where you your right to like redirect um, comes in. So you can ID a package, say this clearly weighs more than five pounds, um, ask for a scale, or in this case, it's 55 pounds. It's gonna be common, common sense. If they won't, um, if they won't redirect the package, that's where you're gonna file that grievance. And we provide or we're sending you a sample grievance that says management is sending packages to the uh, post office that should be redirected for delivery by by a Teamster package car driver. And that's a that also is going to trigger your right to do an information request um, to all the packages that are bound for that zip code. So just take down the details of what happened, who, what, where, when, uh, if you have a, you know, make sure you have a witness and then file the grievance. Um, when we redirect a shirt post package, our clerks have no idea how to do it. Should the soups be showing them how, or what should we do? Yes, the soup soup should be showing them how. But if they don't, this is grievance number one, the one the one that um, uh, our brother from local one thirty five had filed. So we'll send you out a sample grievance on this. Uh, file it right away and get um, and demand that training. Um, can you put an oversized, overweight shirt post that's addressed to a PO box on hold that should be delivered by our UPS driver? I don't know that you could put it on hold, but you could flag it as something that should be redirected. And if the company doesn't redirect it, um, you could file a grievance. Um, if we here's uh, a couple more. If we only have five days from the incident to file a grievance. How long does a management have to honor an information request? Um, if we are to gather documented evidence to support the violation, file the grievance within five days. As soon as it happens, file the grievance, then file the information request. Management um, may stall on providing the information, but it doesn't, that won't affect the timeliness of your upcoming grievances and it's uh you'll be okay on that it's within five days of your knowledge of the violation once we get the additional information that's a good question can part-time preloaders also grieve sure post violations yes um can i file a grievance for sure post packages that are in my center but in another driver's area yes um so uh yeah Hope I, I tried to cover as many as I could fast. It sounds like there's interest in filing these grievances, and I'm glad we're here to help you. Uh, we got to get uh, Teamsters back to work.